having done performances for children, the bassoon is just like weird and mysterious and so versatile. And that maybe a lot of times in our teaching of it and our learning of it, we limit what it can do. Hello, and welcome to Art Restart, where we explore how artists are reinventing their fields and building a new landscape for the arts. I'm Pier Carlo Talenti, the producer and editor of this podcast, brought to you by the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. In this episode, we'll be spending time with bassoonist Dr. Midori Sampson. Midori has a bachelor's degree from Juilliard, a doctorate in musical arts from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and has performed in symphony orchestras and ensembles all over the world. The music you're hearing right now features Midori on bassoon and ankle bells. It is titled A Nightmare by Tanzanian composer Emmanuel Kagondi, and it's a piece that Midori herself commissioned. More on that later. The title bassoonist, though, doesn't capture the breadth of Midori's professional interests and activities. She's also deeply steeped in the practice and tenets of social work, having studied the field throughout her education and even minoring in social work as she earned her PhD. For Midori, who describes herself as equally a bassoonist, educator, activist, and scholar, her commitment to equity and social inclusion is inseparable from her artistry. She's a longtime member of Arts Ignite, a nonprofit that works with artists to unlock children's imaginations and potential. Arts Ignite works throughout the country and as far away as India and the Philippines. She's also the proud co founder and artistic director of Trade Winds Ensemble, a group of professional musicians who teach workshops incorporating music composition, songwriting, interactive games, and creative writing to children around the world. And just a few days after she and I spoke, she traveled to Mardin, Turkey, to take part in the Flying Carpet Festival, where she was looking forward to creating music with refugee children. Incidentally, the Flying Carpet Festival was co-founded by past Art Restart guest, composer Sakba Aminika. Midori spoke to me from her home in Bloomington, Illinois, near Illinois State University, where she's Instructional Assistant Professor of Bassoon. I started the interview by asking her at what point in her musical education she also started becoming passionate about social justice. I think it starts even before Juilliard for me. My parents, I think of them as my two of my favorite hero activists in my life, both in very different ways. My dad is pretty involved in Antifa in Portland, and he is always on the streets doing like real boots on the ground protests and activism that some of us are too scared to do. And my did you go out, did you protest with him when you were a kid? Yeah, I did actually. That, that was very much like part of our, part of my life and part of my childhood, but that always scared my mom who is a dialysis nurse and does home dialysis with patients who are in rural communities and like can't get to their treatment because it's too far or because of other issues of accessibility. So they're both, I think both of my parents are dealing with social justice issues. And I saw this, even though they have no proximity to music and especially classical music, I was still very much around it. So I think that started much before undergrad and was kind of part of my whole life. But I will give Juilliard some credit for being a school that when I was an undergrad in 2010 to 14, they were pretty, I think, ahead of things as far as combining social justice efforts and the arts. I remember them really encouraging us to incorporate art forms into social justice work, combining them. So I I was really nurtured to do that there. And so when, when, when did it start? So I got involved during undergrad. I got involved with an organization called Artists Striving to End Poverty. They're now called Arts Ignite. They match 
teaching artists in all art forms with communities and schools and other organizations worldwide that are doing social impact work, but don't necessarily have arts programming. And they first sent me to India. Um, I went to the Philippines with them and did residencies where we worked with the school and partnered with them to make a curriculum and do an arts a series of arts workshops for the children they serve. That was some of the first things that I did. Did you ever feel, and even now as a musician, do you ever feel like one pursuit or passion detracts from the other? Or do they feed each other? Of course they feed each other. And I wouldn't ever want to do one without the other. I remember after my first year, I was struggling with injury. I was struggling with mental health issues and like really being sad about music and my relationship to it. But I went to the Philippines with ASTEP, Artists Striving to End Poverty. And I came back having truly not practiced at all, (laughs) had only (laughs) done like small casual performances for children all over the Philippines, several different islands, but was, you know, comfortable and playing from the heart and doing things that were challenging in other ways. Who cares about the excellence I had to like get through how hot it was and how buggy it was and how wet it was and like how uncomfortable it was. So that stuff was way more important than playing well at the time. So when I came back, I played a little bit for my teacher, Frank Morelli, and he said, you sound better than ever. How, how hard did you work this summer? And I said, I, I didn't, but I had these other really transformative artistic experiences, making music with children all over the Philippines and composing with them and singing with them, dancing with them. And the kind of like holistic education that that provides is way better than practicing. (laughs) And I, I explained that to my teacher and he totally agreed. And I'm so thankful for that because he nurtured that in me. So many other teachers would have said that they would have punished me for that or would have like shut down that kind of behavior, but he really nurtured that and allowed me to do that. And it, it, of course, it impacted the way I played and still do. One of your passions, of course, is examining the pedagogy of music. Mm -hmm. I wonder, and it sounds like your bassoon teacher understood the value of life experience. Are you finding that the way music is taught is already changing? That there are more Morellis Mm. out there? Oh, definitely. (laughs) And I think, I think also because I'm teaching now at a state university, which really prioritizes the pedagogy part of it and teaching. Like I really focus on my, my bassoon students, for example, my undergrad bassoon students, teaching them how to teach. And also I have them read articles about social justice issues in music. And I have them reflect on those and ponder those. And that is part of the curriculum, just as important of a part of the curriculum as like learning the scales and making reads. It's all goes alongside of those, all of those things. So the holistic approach that I try to do, I, I'm inspired by many of my colleagues that I see doing the same thing, where caring for the body and caring for mental health and caring for the community is like just as important as the practicing part. Or, I mean, I think it's way more important, but Sure, we should also practice and work hard, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but your but students who, might be hearing this. Careful. They should they should hear it. <laughs> Not because I I will be so impressed if they care for themselves in those ways and they will they'll play better anyway. So yeah. I, I think it's definitely different and I'm really grateful for that. So now it makes me think about the traditional concert hall, classical concert hall as I know it, which I think of as being so hierarchical and really focused on excellence for obvious reasons, maybe less focus on mental health, I guess. Yeah. Are you sensing, given that some music students are being taught in a different way, are you starting to see those changes reflected in the concert hall culture or what has yet to be done there? Yeah, maybe, maybe in some ways. Yes. So Hmm. Where do I start? So, well, first of all, this is when I'm glad we're not on video because when you say the word excellence, especially in the context of 
the concert hall, I just have this huge eye roll. Like, <laughs> again, oh, no, like, no, I wish we were on video. Are you kidding? I know. I know. It's, <laughs> yeah, for, for the sake of my students, I'm glad that they don't see that. So this is this was a big part of my dissertation research was thinking about a concert hall in the context of a trauma informed lens, because I think there is across the history of classical music and still today, so much trauma and humiliation around like striving for excellence and both, I think, humiliation and excellence have also been used as weapons of white supremacy. So I think of the concert hall as like another expression of trauma, hierarchy, white supremacy, power, dominance, all the things. So isn't it interesting to think about like the the way that like social workers defined being trauma informed is things like natural light, furniture that can be moved, having clear sight lines, having easily accessible and like uh, chairs and spaces that you can navigate through, having equal level seating and no hierarchy of like power. And all these things are so exemplified in the concert hall in in the bad way. So like- I want to make sure I understand the term trauma-informed meaning. Being trauma-informed acknowledges that all people have experienced some kind of trauma and not just like a single event trauma, but it could be trauma over time, sustained trauma, collective trauma experienced by a group, generational trauma experienced across generations. All of these things are under the umbrella of trauma and and being trauma informed acknowledges that that is an experience that a lot of people bring to their everyday lives. And then what kind of things can a trauma-informed strategy do to eliminate making that worse or prevent re-traumatization? I see. So a concert hall that is trauma-informed and thinking of a space that is lacking in being trauma-informed is a space, like I said, that's has no natural light, <laughs> which is our concert halls. The stage is elevated, so there's automatic like, power involved. You very rarely can decide where you sit, and even if you can, the seat is like bolted down and you can't decide which direction you're looking. Having an escape plan or like a, an exit plan is very important, and that usually lacks in crowded seats. So all of that is, is how I think of a concert hall. And maybe I've drifted kind of far from the original question, but I mean, I think this is part of the discussion of pedagogy and like how we think of excellence and what we prioritize. Right. Because what I'm hearing you say is that there's some, there's a rigidity of the concert hall, which is based in kind of white European roots, which to my ear is trauma informed also means it's just not welcoming. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's one of the big tenets of being trauma informed. Like, is is the space welcoming? And how many times have we like accidentally turned away a concert goer because there are so many barriers of entry that could be unwelcoming? The person who greets you at the door, the parking situation. Like everyone has acknowledged that parking is a big barrier of access to going to a concert. And then all the steps along the way, like finding your seat is stressful and not welcoming. And then once you do sit down, are you around patrons who have certain etiquette expectations of you that you don't know about? See, there's a lot about it that's unwelcoming. You yourself will soon be welcomed at the Flying Carpet Festival in Turkey. How or what will you be teaching the children there? One of the projects that we're going to try to do is having the students that we work with compose short pieces that are in the style of In C by Terry Riley. So this is a a piece with aleatoric techniques where there are 50, around 50 short one bar segments of music and the performers play them at their leisure, moving through all 50, playing them multiple times. And it creates this beautiful soundscape of like slightly improvised but organized music and so what I'd like to do in Turkey is have children compose their own cells their own like short segments of music and these are children who 
have not composed music in that way before. All children do all the time. They're always singing and dancing and creating. Sing song, so, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So I want to kind of utilize that, but then have them document it in a way, keeping them really tiny. You know, it could be one one short bar like Terry Riley does, ba-da, 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 over and over again. So just a small gesture like that. But if the student is handwriting it and composing it themselves, and then they're holding up their piece of music that they made, watching the performer play it for them, there's so much pride and they've, they've gone through like the experimentation process. They're so validated hearing their little piece played. And then it gets to fit into this wider composition with all of the students' short pieces being played. That's like real autonomy where they actually co-created the work of art. How and beautiful. I think that's so much more effective than like trying to convince them to like Mozart or something. <laughs> I realize I didn't ask you how you first picked up the bassoon. It's not, it's not, you know, the <laughs> typical violin or piano or clarinet, I guess. And it's especially not expected from me, someone who is a first generation college graduate, like comes from a family of non-music, non-arts people. I think that makes it a little extra unusual. And it's also a very tall instrument for, for a young person. <laughs> it must yeah. be quite a challenge. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm I'm four foot ten also. Oh, so it's yeah, also, I'm, okay. I'm small and it's it's <laughs> almost as tall as me and it's always been quite large for me. Um, so how did you pick it up? <laughs> I think the story goes that when I was like four years old, I came home from school and somewhere, somehow I had heard a bassoon. And I said, like that I think that's like my thing. I think that's what I wanna do. And I guess I I had to wait till I was big enough. So I waited until I was 11. And then in the meantime, I learned how to play piano, which, wow, talk about trauma and humiliation. I think so many people have stories about that with their piano lessons. So that that wasn't really my voice. And then I played the clarinet for a while. And that also wasn't my voice. And then finally, when I was big enough, I could play the bassoon. And it somehow I found my thing. And it still is my thing. So since we're talking about the bassoon, I'm thinking it is it is an instrument that historically has been limited to the European classical canon, but I know you're not satisfied with that. So could you talk <laughs> about how you've been working to expand the bassoon repertoire? Yeah, so this is another part of my research. I do like talking about how bassoon has ties to colonialism and is like very close to that history. So I have to acknowledge that in in the work that I want to do, but I also know that having done performances for children, the bassoon is just like weird and mysterious and so versatile. And that maybe a lot of times in our teaching of it and our learning of it, we limit what it can do. So I, in 2017, started commissioning several works by composers from all over Africa. And I met, I did a lot of like cold calls and a lot of Facebook messages, a lot of WhatsApp texts out of nowhere. And why did you pick that continent in particular? Uh, it's because I, so I have an organization that I co-direct called Tradewinds Ensemble. And some of our early work was in East Africa, working with communities and schools in East Africa, because one of our founding members grew up there. And so we were over there and knew how important it was that we were performing for our students works by people who came from similar musical traditions and similar cultural traditions. So I connected with, I think it's 12 composers now who have each composed a new solo work for bassoon. And of course, because, because it's a huge diverse continent and I'm working with people in 12 different countries, of course, oh, these each, works, each composer is from a different country. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So of course the works are quite diverse in style, in notation system, in texture and instrumentation, all of the ways that they are incredibly diverse and the one common denominator is that the bassoon is somehow involved. So for example, Elsa Mbala, who wrote me a piece, she uh, lives in Germany, she's from Cameroon, 
she sent me the score and it was entirely a graphic score uh, that she created digitally. And then it comes with a soundscape track that I play with. But then there's also Grace Bernard Oforka, who comes from a very old traditional vocal style in Nigeria. She sent me a very, like, the notation was familiar to me and the the singing style was familiar to me. So that that also came to me in this commissioning project. Then there's a very traditional how how the bassoon is used to playing. I, that's what I mean by traditional piece by Peter Nyabuto, which is a basically like a bassoon and piano sonata, but it's based on rhythms from the eastern part of Kenya. So there was so much so much diversity in style and notation system in these commissions that I got. And I think that shows people, reminds people that Africa is not a country and that there are so many diverse artists who are creating there. Do you get a sense that colleagues, different instrumentalists are starting to do this kind of commissioning work just to give themselves a variety of new things to play? Definitely. And I have a colleague who always talks about musicians are getting better about having diverse artists on their music stands, but that it's much harder to have diverse artists in the room and in leadership positions. So I I think there's definitely a lot more work to do and the work does not stop with commissioning, especially if um, it's just like a commission and that's it. And, And we don't acknowledge the person behind the work and their life and their stories So a big part of my commissioning effort was to also document interviews of the composers that whenever I perform the works, there's always a multimedia component where their interviews are played before the piece so that we can really see their voice and their thinking behind the music, their approach to composing, and also their identity as a person and musician. Have you had a chance to perform these pieces anywhere in Africa yet? I did, yes. The, oh, some of this was supposed to happen in 2020, and it oh, obviously got postponed. There, there are still plans to do that. I also think it would be great to have musicians over there take it over, and and they can own it and and do that. So I also have like a grassroots sheet music distribution where, through my website, bassoonists can like purchase the works and. I send payments to the composers because there are a lot of just kind of logistical, tricky things about getting U.S. currency to all these different oh countries. Um, How did you rope yourself <laughs> into this? Oh, it's it's wonderful. I'm getting I, I anxious mean, just hearing about this. <laughs> well, it's it's because when George Floyd was murdered, there was a lot of guilt around people realizing that they didn't play diverse music at all. So, of like, I heard from a lot of people who wanted to purchase sheet music. There wasn't a mechanism to do that because a lot of the works were unpublished. And a lot of the composers did not have a way to publish or receive money from the U.S. So I have my own ways with each composer, anything from like sending a a PayPal once a month to like once a year sending with a friend cash that they take to the Congo to deliver to the composer. So there are like different ways that I do it with everybody. There are some people who have purchased them from all over the continent of Africa. So I know that there are other people performing them there, which is even better than me doing it there. Do you have any interest? You kind of touched on this earlier. Do you yourself have any interest in taking a leadership position in a musical institution? (laughs) No. Oh, well. (laughs) (laughs) That's a totally Um, honest answer. I get it. Well, it's hard for me because I, I have, like I said, really benefited from institutions and I still do. And, you know, I the secret is that I work at a university so that I can get some of the benefits that come with that. Because working at an institution like does mean that I can pursue the projects that mean a lot to me, like this one. But I also really dislike a lot of things about institutions. And I really dislike all the problems that come with dominance and that is really expressed in institutions but I also know that the way 
to make change is to be in that position. So I, I really struggle with this question and I, I don't know if I have the yes, patience and you can't, for it. <laughs> and you can't be the only musician or composer of color who f- faces this quandary, right? Yeah. No, I mean, everybody, this is a struggle and this is like, this is the struggle of going into academia. I think like it's, uh, yeah, it's really hard for me. And I, every day question it and think about it and, you're you're inviting me to do the same, so thank you. Oh my god, but, <laughs> but I don't I don't want to end, the, end this interview on oh no, so. it's it's not it's not uh, it's not sad, but it is like definitely something to ponder because what really makes me happy is composing weird sound art and working with diverse collaborators and going to places to to meet diverse collaborators. But what, how, how do you make that happen for yourself? And like, I also know that it's really important that my students see me doing that. And the way for me to make an impact as an educator would be at an institution where I can directly impact the lives of students who can maybe think about how music and social justice fit into their lives too. Finally, what upcoming artistic projects, or no, actually any project, whether social justice or artistic, since they're so closely linked for you, what are you most looking forward to in the coming year? We already talked about the trip to Turkey next week. I think that's really going to be a highlight of life. But since we already talked about it, I'll name one other thing. I, in May, did a pilgrimage with my parents to the camp where camp in California where my grandmother was incarcerated during the incarceration of Japanese people during World War II. And so that was incredible to see the land and to learn about some of the stories that would have been true about my grandmother who was there at Tule Lake. We learned, you know, her her family's ID number, which I now have tattooed on my arm. Like it, it was a very transformative trip. But part of the trip was that I took audio sounds and soundscape recordings of the land and of uh, sounds that I heard both outside and inside one of the prison cells, just all over the camp. And I've been mixing that into a track and composing a bassoon part that goes with it, all a tribute to my grandmother and to the Japanese incarceration. So that is a big recording project that I'm doing right now, which deals with trauma and resilience and identity. And it will go on my album, which will come out someday. If you'd like to read a longer version of this interview, please head to uncsa.edu slash art restart. If you enjoyed this episode and your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, won't you please give us a thumbs up? Oh, and if you haven't heard the episode featuring Sakba Aminikia, the co-founder of the Flying Carpet Festival, check it out. It was the first episode of season three. Many thanks to composer Emmanuel Kagondi and to Midori for allowing us to use excerpts from A Nightmare. Our theme music is by Shanghai Restoration Project. I'm Pierre Carlo Talenti, and on behalf of the Keenan Institute for the Arts, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>